Every now and again, a serious philosophy sweeps belatedly into intellectual fashion, usually as a result of some particular set of circumstances. Between the two world wars, this happened to Marxism, mainly as a result of the Russian Revolution. After the Second World War, it happened to existentialism, the fashion for which began on the continent of Europe in response largely to the experience of Nazi occupation. When I talk of a philosophy being fashionable, I'm speaking of its catching on not only with a lot of academics, but with writers of all kinds, novelists, playwrights, poets, journalists, so that it begins to pervade the whole cultural atmosphere of the time. In post-war France, there seemed to be existentialist novels, films, plays, and even conversation on all sides. The most famous name associated with that development, both then and now, is that of Jean-Paul Sartre. But the existentialism of this century really began not in France, but in Germany, and in the period following the First World War. And in serious terms, the most significant figure of the movement is not Sartre, but Heidegger. That's to say, there's virtual unanimity among students of modern existentialism that Heidegger, as well as preceding Sartre in time, is the more profound and more original thinker. So, in this program, we're going to approach modern existentialism chiefly through the work of Heidegger, though later on we shall have a bit to say about Sartre and how he fits into the picture. Martin Heidegger was born in southern Germany in 1889 and lived in the same small area of Europe for virtually the whole of his life. He studied under the famous philosopher Husserl before himself becoming a professional teacher of philosophy. In 1927, at the age of 38, he published his most important book called Being and Time. He was to live for getting on for another half century after that, and he wrote a great deal more, some of it very interesting. But nothing else of his was ever to be as big or as good or as influential as Being and Time. It's not an easy book to read. But we have here, to talk about it, the author of what I think is the best of all introductions to existentialism for the general reader, William Barrett, professor of philosophy at New York University and author of that excellent book, Irrational Man. Professor Barrett, if you can imagine for the moment that I'm somebody who knows absolutely nothing at all about the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, and you were going to start setting about giving me some basic idea, how would you begin? I, I think I would uh, try to locate the man in his historical context to begin with. It would be a little bigger context th than the one you indicate, namely it wouldn't be measured in terms of decades but centuries. And I'd, I'd try to locate him first in relation to the, let's say the whole epoch of modern philosophy which begins with Descartes. It was rather interesting to place him in, in, in that context because it relates him and differentiates him from other philosophers in the 20th century. Now, a, as you know, Descartes <clears throat> was one of the founders of the new science, that is, of modern physics. And part of his scheme for launching this science depended upon a certain kind of split between consciousness and the external world. The mind schematized nature for quantitative measures, uh, for calculation, for the purpose of manipulating nature, and at the same time, the human subject, the consciousness doing that, was set off against it. So you've, what came out of it was a certain kind of dualism between mind and the external world. Now, most philosophy, nearly all philosophy, in the subsequent two centuries, accommodated itself to the Cartesian framework. Uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of this century, a number of philosophers began to feel that, in some sense, it was uncomfortable. And we find that the, a kind of revolt or rebellion against Cartesianism <coughs> takes place among different schools, both in England and on the continent, as a matter of fact, with the American pragmatists, too. Now, Heidegger is one of those rebels against Descartes. And if you stop to think of it, <coughs> In this rebellion against Descartes, I think <clears throat> we would get the key idea of Heidegger's philosophy with which I would, st would want to start educating somebody in the philosophy. May, let me make sure yes. that, 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 so to speak, we're, yes. we're together up to this yes, starting right. point. What you're saying, in effect, is this, that uh, with the development of yeah. modern science, which really began in the 16th century, 
we get this, the development of the assumption that there is somehow a split in reality between subject and object. Yes. There are <clears throat> humans observing the world, and there is the world which they are observing. Right. And this dualism, this assumption that there is a division in reality between subject and object, yes. goes all the way through our science and all the way through our philosophy. Right. Though, in fact, contrary to what probably most Western men and women suppose, it's really a, a view of reality which is peculiar to the West and peculiar to the last four or five centuries. Right. Right. Now, now, now it's I, an uncomfortable <coughs> view because there is, in some sense, we don't live with this view. I don't, I don't consider you as a mind attached to a body or I don't consider that I'm conscious of you there but I infer your existence. Your existence is, is doubtful. In ordinary life, we move back and forth between mind and body in perfectly recognizable fashion without proposing to ourselves any particular philosophical puzzles in, 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 in these transactions. So that it, it becomes somehow contrary to our ordinary feel of things to proceed in this way as if the mind and the external world were set off against each other in this way. And this revolt against dualism, I think, is one of the features of 20th century philosophy, and Heidegger has his own mode of dealing with it. I think uh, <clears throat> you and I are together in the same world. I mean, you're not a mind attached to a body, and I'm not a mind attached to a body primarily. We're two human beings within the same world. So you ask me, how would you start introducing somebody, uh, someone to Heidegger's philosophy? I would, I would say you start with this fundamental concept of being in the world, that we are beings in the world. <coughs> of course, now, the word being makes us recoil because it sounds very far-fetched mm -hmm. and highfalutin. But in the primary cases, in this case, we have to understand it in the most mundane, factual, ordinary, everyday sense, the way in which average, ordinary, or extraordinary human beings are concretely in the world. That's where we start from. And that's what, where we begin to philosophize. But. May I say that I find this a very congenial starting point because the notion that reality is split mm. between observer and observed or subject and object mm. isn't something that ever presented itself naturally to me. It was something I had to learn, mm -hmm. so to speak, in school or as a student. And at first I thought it a very strange idea. I think that the experience of the individual accords much more with what you are yeah. now saying. That is to say we we emerge from the unconsciousness of early babyhood, so to speak, to find ourselves as beings in a world, which is the phrase you just yes. used. We just find ourselves here in this world. And, the split and that's between, where we start. Yes. Well, the split between subject and object doesn't appear in philosophy until you get really at formulating Descartes. It's unknown to the Greeks and the medieval philosophers. Oh. But now, having, uh, having established the difference between uh, Heidegger and the tradition, mm -hmm. How does Heidegger then proceed? What does he, how does he proceed to formulate his problem? Well, you see, the, the, once you're planted in, in, in the world, we are beings of the world, then the task of philosophy becomes primarily one of, of description. You, uh, the philosopher then aims to describe the various modes or ways in which we exist within this world. Now, in, in in this respect, you see, Heidegger's approach is a little different from some of the anti-Cartesian rebels in British philosophy, let's say Moore or Wittgenstein, who start with very definite problems of knowledge and perception. How do we know the external world and so on? Now, <clears throat> what I would like to say is that you see that in, in this respect, when you propose an epistemological question, you are already in the world to propose it. Your ticket of admission to the ordinary world is not contingent upon your solving that puzzle. When you say epistemological, you mean anything to do with the theory of knowledge? Knowledge, of belief, the perception, of yes. and so on. Yes. So that uh, knowledge is, is simply one other mode of our being in the world. And the various modes in which we are in the world. I mean, some of them are, <clears throat> are much more urgent and less theoretical than knowledge. We are, in the world, in various fashions, we're anxiety-ridden sometimes. We're worried. Does, does we're the concerned. name existentialism imply that the existentialist philosophers see existence as a problem? 
it's a problem since we have to cope with it, but it's, it's the given in any case. I mean, it's not inferred, but uh, the, the problem is then to characterize it descriptively. I think it's quite important to, to emphasize, apropos of Heidegger, that his, his aim is descriptive. He is not a speculative metaphysician. He's not, he's not erecting any abstract speculative um, theory about what ultimate reality is. If his, if his ideas stand or fall, they stand or fall in terms of whether they're adequately they, they adequately describe, you see, our actual experience. Would, would you agree with this formulation, that throughout the uh, history of Western philosophy, mm -hmm. Um, the central problem, really, of our whole philosophical tradition has been the problem of knowledge. Mm. What is it to know? What do we know? How do we know that we know? Yeah. How can we be sure, etc.? That is the, the key problem all the way through. But Heidegger isn't concerned with that problem centrally. Mm. He's concerned with the problem of what it is to be, right. what it is to exist. How is it that anything exists at all? What is this existence that we find um. ourselves in? And that's a quite different kind of problem, isn't it? Which exactly. fascinates some people, but I think is hard for other people to get hold of because it's unusual in a sense, it is unusual. in our tradition. But I'd, I'd like to point out that the, the preempting of the central role in philosophy, the problem of knowledge, is really something which has characterized philosophy more or less since Descartes. I mean, it was discussed by earlier philosophers, but it did not yes. have quite that, that absolutely central place that it had after Descartes. So in some sense, it's a return. Uh, Heidegger thinks of himself in some sense as um, uh, a follower of the Greeks. Greek but tradition. you say that what Heidegger is trying to do is to give a description of the reality in which we find ourselves, to give a, a description of being, of existence, mm. of what there is. Human existence. Human existence. Mm. But, I mean, a layman might ask, well, what's the point of this? I mean, we have this existence. Here we are. We're living it. It's, it's, it's in a sense, all we have. What is the point of describing uh, that which we are already having, or that with which we are already utterly familiar? What could, can a description of this give us that we haven't already got? Well, it's the familiar that usually eludes us in life. I mean, what's before our nose is what we see last. It's true that the features of human existence which he describes are in many ways commonplace when you get through with his analysis, but you haven't seen them quite in this way before. And I, I, I think it's the case that people don't see what's before them. They look past it or look through it in, in one way or another. And the um, adequate description of, of, uh, of experience would, in some sense, enlighten our eyes to what, what there is, and, uh, which is not e easy to see in all cases. Well, now, does, does this mean that, that there is, throughout Heidegger, uh, an emphasis on the everyday, on the yes, ordinary, the beginning. on the familiar? Yes in its familiar things, but there's also a, an emphasis on the extraordinary, the unusual. You see, if, if I compare Heidegger in this respect with another philosopher of the everyday, using that term in general sense, let's say the later Wittgenstein, the, the comparison is rather interesting in one respect, because Wittgenstein envisages the task of philosophy to be unraveling the snarls of our ordinary language, so that then we can continue functioning on the same plane let's say, the sort of level plane of uh, efficient communication within the world. Now, uh, in this sense, we almost envisage with Wittgenstein the possibility if we unraveled all the snarls in language, philosophy would disappear, or the problems or questions which set us into philosophy would disappear. But now, you see, in Heidegger's case, we move along that plane of ordinary reality, and there's suddenly all extraordinary gaps abrupt kinds of experiences which are very extraordinary. Well, now, I think we are getting Heidegger in our sight, so yes. to speak, but I think people watching this discussion yeah. will be beginning to ask themselves, well, yes, but what does he actually say? What does he talk about? What are his doctrines? Now, what are some of the central themes with which he's concerned? And let's start going into what he has to say right. about them. Well, for example, the one characteristic of human existence in the We've talked a little bit about, you and I, this notion of what he calls the, the throneness of human existence. The, the word in German looks very imposing, geworfenheit, literally throneness, but it, it's, it's a rather simple notion. We're thrown into the world. 
And uh, this is a case of w where what is most ordinary and banal um, is nevertheless a quite extraordinary fact about our individual human destiny. Well, do we, we simply find ourselves we, here without, as it were, a by your leave or anyone well, having asked we did, us? We didn't pick our parents. Yes. We are born of yes. those parents. We are born at this particular time. We are born with whatever genetic structure is given to us. Mm -hmm. And this is the load we take upon us in order to fashion a life.